let me let me suggest the following that in in his essay on the Lviv pogrom, Mr. Zahibka specifically refers to the date of July first when he accuses the OUN, because the accused here by Mr. Himka is not the auxiliary militia or even the Ukrainian militia, but the accused is the OUN. So what you need to do is you need to connect the dots. You need to show, A, that the Ukrainian militia, which acted on July 1st, was one that was put together by the OUN. That's the first point. Your major problem with this is that militias were made up of the militia which existed under Soviet times. There was a Soviet militia before OUN, before the Germans, and before anybody else arrived in view. Those people were in the militia that allegedly participated in a pogrom which you allege to have taken place only on July 1st, 1941, and no other days. Subsequently, there was an auxiliary Ukrainian militia created by the Germans, and if you look at your exhibit number 8, that exhibit number 8, the ID card, is specifically in two languages, Ukrainian and German, and it is signed by a German official. That militia was not created by the OUN. That militia was created by the Germans. And the function of that militia is very clear. To gather, to follow, in other words, to keep order, and it specifies that. I, I'm, ex I'm taking one of your documents. And it specifies that they're supposed to keep order. Nowhere in any of these documents does it say that the OUN was responsible or carried out the killings. In fact, nowhere in these documents, and I'm assuming I'm taking you at face value, these documents. Now, let's assume that they're legitimate documents. All right? despite the fact that they haven't been tested or forensically or in any other way. Let's assume that they're le legitimate documents. Nowhere did they say that the Ukrainian militia executed. They gathered, they put the Jews together, and nowhere does it say that the initial Ukrainian militia, the one that allegedly perpetrated the pogrom of July 1st, was put together by Oun. And in fact, in your article, in your essay, you acknowledge that fact, that it doesn't say that, but you say, well, it was probably that way. Now, let's talk briefly about eyewitness testimony. Interestingly enough, the two that you do, let's, let's go, just, I, I apologize for this. I'm going to go back to the German document. The German document talks about militia. It doesn't even say what type of militia. It talks about the fact that they were, that there were Ukrainians murdered by the Soviets. But when it talks about militia, it doesn't even mention the word Ukrainian. Now, what is very important here, all right, are eyewitness testimony, because eyewitness testimony can identify the documents. But these documents are not identified by eyewitness testimony. Mr. Himka offers two pieces of testimony. One, and these are both taken in, one in 1944, one in 1940, I believe subsequently, at, they, they are taken by the Institute, the Jewish Historical Institute, which was in Poland. Now, let's consider there is an old saying amongst attorneys, not only among my profession, but in general, he lied like an eyewitness. Really, that's a Russian saying. Excuse me. That's a Russian saying as well. Eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses who are called upon to testify 
as to a specific topic. Can you imagine if you're called in by the Institute to, to give eyewitness testimony about the Holocaust and you are Jewish, all right? You not only tell what you know, but you also tell what you don't know. You embellish because you want to please the people who are taking your testimony. And interestingly enough, in this particular instance, and Mr. Himko will acknowledge this as well, that in the Institute, the Historical in Institute, they, the people who were taking the testimony were instructed not to interfere, even if there was anything in the testimony that was in, incredible and the witness was incredulous, all right? That you are not to interfere. You're supposed to simply take down what they're saying. Now, let's take the first testimony. This testimony is only relevant if it applies to July 1st. But surprisingly enough, between July 1st and the document itself and reference to the militia, there are at least four words which Mr. Himka conveniently omitted. There is no evidence to show that the militia actually acted on July 1st because there's no connection with it. And the second document, interestingly enough, this witness is a phenomenal witness because this witness, Yanislaw Kurczynski, says the day after the entrance of the Germans into Lviv, I saw how a group of Ukrainians with yellow and blue armbands conducted a group of Jews, women, and men, about 70 persons to the prison on Zamartenu Street. As they led them, they beat them with clubs, and, and at the gate stood several Ukrainians who beat all those who went in. All right? Now, clearly, the Germans had to be involved in this. Okay? He's giving testimony about allegedly what he saw. But there is no opportunity to ask him to cross-examine this witness. This is a, a wonderful opportunity. I don't know whether you gentlemen are familiar with memoirs. I, in particular, read memoirs written by older Ukrainians. And they are some of the biggest heroes, uh, given the fact that many have died and nobody remembers or nobody knows what actually took place. All right? We eyewitnesses become, they add, unimaginable things into their testimony. The problem is that maybe this is true, but there's no opportunity. Maybe it's not. And you cannot condemn even the militia. They don't even mention the Oun, so it's completely irrelevant as far as our discussion is concerned. But they talk about the militia, but even that is sub suspect because they can't be cross-examined. Photographs. No identification. Let's take photograph number one. No identification. When this photograph was taken, who these people are, who saw this, all right? This could have been, could have been staged in Kinostudia Dojenka, for all I know. In the case of photographs, you have to have chain of custody. You have to establish that. You have to identify, none of which mis is being done by Mr. Himka. Jeffrey Burns is another one who does the same thing, just accepts photos. The same applies to the, the shot from the film. And frankly speaking, I'm not denying that the militia, the auxiliary militia, may have been involved in forcing Jews to exhume the bodies of those Poles and Ukrainians who had been murdered in, by the Soviets. I'm not doubting that, but I'm saying that even this has no authentication or identification. And finally, with all due respect, Professor, coalition is a joke, all right? Because coalition, you're using coalition to show his participation in the pogrom of July 1st, yet his card isn't issued until July 23rd or 24th, and the card says that he, he became a policeman on July the 3rd. And this is not the so-called Stichko militia. This is the so-called German auxiliary militia. 
And once again, I'm not defending the German auxiliary militia. Consequently, with all due respect, your evidence may be evidence had it been authenticated, all right? And furthermore, its biggest problem, it doesn't connect the OUN with the militia. And still furthermore, it doesn't allege that the militia perpetrated killings. It only suggests that the militia picked up the Jews and brought them together, which I'm not, I'm not denying. I'm just suggesting that it was not at any time under the control of the Organization of Ukrainian Action. 